That music is unmistakable, isn't it? Good evening and welcome to this WCVB special, marking the end of an era. I'm Ed Harding, and tomorrow morning at 10.30, Candlepin Bowling makes its final appearance on Channel 5, bringing to a close 38 years of spares and strikes and closing the book on a local TV institution. Tonight, we'll reminisce with series host Don Gillis, and Ted Reinstein will give us a quick course in Candlepin culture. But first, let's go to the videotape. Of course, tomorrow morning at 10.30, the last bowler to step on the alley will be a fellow by the name of Zernike, and it's perfect that he will take to the alley. You judge a sport by its fans, and the people of Candlepin Bowling had a rare passion indeed. It was only a television program, but it played like tribal drama. exciting. I, I like to bowl. I like to watch it. I get a lot out of it. I, I sit home and jump with these guys. I, it's great. <laughs> now, from the Pilgrim Wings in Haverhill, it's the 18th annual Candlepin Bowling. Candlepin Bowling was one of Boston's most watched television sports shows week in, week out. One of the most watched. And it all started on just a 13-week trial run 38 years ago. Now let's do, let's line and up the bows for this rehearsal. So the can get it had a ramshackle charm. It was hugely entertaining. It involved two-year-olds on up to their great-grandfathers just a lane or two away. But for the director of Candlepin Bowling, Phil Rubin, it was the challenge. It was cold and pure and the essence of competition. <laughs> and there is no other, that's pure athletic competition in its purest form, as opposed to even team performances. Can't get any more gritty and more nuts and bolts than having a one-on-one -on -one athletic competition. And that's what it was. Right now, Ed Zernike is going for that. He's at 161. Here he goes. 161, look at that. My gosh, he did it! He did it! Ten marks in a row, Ed Zernike. What a string he has going! But now, if he gets this, he will have done it. He will have done it. He did it! He is the only man to ever have 11 marks in a row. The only man in the history of Candlepin Bowling. The great moments of Candlepin Bowling were heavy with emotion and sentiment and loyalty and pride. Two strikes in a row for George Raymond. Strikes in a row, an extra bonus of $1,000. Here we go. He got it. He got it. Four strikes in a row. $2,000. Tom Olsta was the Ted Williams of Candlepin Bowling. More than 90 appearances on the program, and he never failed to turn in a highly successful performance. He showed humility where possible, daring whenever needed. Scorn for anything but victory. To keep Craig in the match, he needs five to tie and six to win. Three consecutive strikes. He won. See, everybody gets caught up in it. You get the crowd here. You're out here trying to perform. And you get caught up in it, too. You get excited for what you're doing. Um, whether it's a ball player hitting a home run in the bottom of the ninth, he gets excited doing it. And it's the same thing, throwing three strikes in a row, four strikes in a row, a, a mark to win. You get caught up in that excitement, too. You're doing what you want to do, and it's under pressure. You know, the lights of the TV, you know, and there's lots of people watching. And to perform under the pressure, you have the money, too. That does help. Uh, but it's just the love of the game and being able to perform under those circumstances that I've been blessed with doing it, and I love doing it. Hamilton Bowling. But the man with the personal magic, the man who turned a frog into a prince every week, was the man behind the mic. Welcome once again to Campbell Donald Bowling. Gillis understood the lethal competition that was played out on the bowling lanes, and he appreciated the grand gestures of his championship bowlers. He's at... A fantastic 193... 
That's it, the highest three ever. Paul Berger has the highest three-string total that we've ever had. The only guy who ever hit the 500, and uh, that was a very exciting day. Sport has to do with the celebration of the moment. The moment for Candleton Bowling has passed. 38 years of genial neighborhood sport will be celebrated only in its absence. We will not see its like again. By the way, in kind of perfect symmetry, tomorrow's final show features contestant John Zernike, a member of Candleton's most famous family. John's mother, Stacia, is considered by many to be the best woman Candleton bowler ever. And John's brother, Ed, holds the show's high score record. In a moment, Candlepins, then and now. So please stay with us. Coming up next, Young America Bowl. Then, body English varies with the person bowling. And now. <laughs> if you haven't been bowling lately, you really haven't missed much. Now, that's not a put down. It's just a statement of fact. The sport doesn't change much. It's still the fun family game that boomers grew up on in the 50s. You want proof? Ted Reinstein has the documented evidence. The sport we know today is candlepin bowling can trace its history back over 7,000 years to 5200 B.C. when implements for a similar game were discovered in the tomb of an Egyptian child. Well, whether or not King Tut ever whooped it up at the Luxor Lanes, we do know that that unique New England style of bowling, candle pins, had its start right here, a hundred years ago in the basement of this Worcester YMCA. For the sport's first several decades, the pins were set and reset by hand. Dangerous work for a boy, and a job that Bill Bolton will never forget. I was setting on 9 and 10 here one day, and a fellow threw a ball in number 9, and uh, on the 10-pin side, I hit a pin, and the ceiling down back here is 12 foot in the air, and it just missed the ceiling. And when it came back down, it, it landed right beside me. It didn't come down on top. It landed right beside me. So, you know, if it ever hit me in the head, it would have killed me. The Lanesville work were at the Turnpike Bowlodrome on Route 2 in Cambridge. His dad built the bowling alley in 1942, and Bill himself ran it later. The current owners call it Lanes and Games, and on any given bustling evening, it's a good example of the enduring popularity of candle pens, and how the sport hasn't changed all that much over the last 50 years or so. For proof, we referred to this promotional film originally produced by the Massachusetts Bowling Association. For starters, take technique. Once the fundamentals of the game are learned, each individual develops his or her particular style. Body English varies with the person bowling. Clearly, body English is still spoken here. Then there's the popular tradition of league play. Shops, offices, and churches sponsor bowling leagues consisting of several mixed teams. This was, in fact, league night at Lanes and Games, 12 leagues in all, including this one from the IRS. John Mullaney is their enthusiastic captain. Do you get that fired up when you audit somebody or just when you bowl? Both. Then there's the truly timeless element of bowling shoes. Now, don't those look just like the ones you wore your first time bowling? In fact, those might be the very pair. How do they keep them going? This blue can right here. This? Yes. This is the secret. Yes. That's it's it. Eponymic. That's right. And you just spray these shoes? A little bit in each side, in each one. And it's ready to go. And that's it. Yep. This that's affects. It. How many times do you think these shoes have been worn? A few hundred. Is that a lot? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah? But if you think that's something, these right here. How many terms are these from? Uh, about three, four thousand. Three, four thousand. Three, four thousand. Wow. So they need to be sprayed a lot. Yeah. Of course, some yeah. things about bowling have changed, including some attitudes. Free swinging arm movements and follow through help develop grace and poise in the fair sex. Yikes. These days, women are just as apt to leave the men, even the kids at home, for a girls' night out. So I see my friends, my sister. It's great. It's like one big family after 15 years. Actually, bowling's biggest change over the last 50 years came about 50 years ago. Pin-setting machines revolutionized the game. But did you ever wonder what goes on behind the pins? So did we. 
the machines at Lanes and Games are not only about 50 years old and the original, but the only ones of their kind still in use anywhere, which makes repairing them a genuine adventure. To be sure, while candle pins is the bowling game of choice in these parts, it should be noted that there are those who prefer the bigger 10 pins, and so the two camps coexist. Sort of. Candle pin bowlers are very defensive about their little niche in the world, which is fine. Candle pin bowlers are more or less shaped like the candle pin. Lean, mean, tough. 10 pin bowlers got the wide middle. You know, they sort of look like a 10 pin. That's a pretty good analogy. It is Actually, it's a little more strenuous game in candle pin, to be quite honest with you. Um, they throw in three balls instead of two, which is not a big deal, but they threw it at a fast, they do it at a faster pace. So he may have something there. What we have here is more bowling variety than most regions of the country, and in Candlepins, a game that has made its home in New England and changed remarkably little over the last 50 years. Set them up, knock them down. Not a bad night out. Oh, and some of those film tips aren't dated at all. And above all, be a good sport. It isn't the fault of the pins if you don't score well. Let's go bowling. By the way, Ted did find one big transformation underway now in bowling. It's the changeover from the old telescoring system to a computer setup that uses TV screens and graphics. A Massachusetts company, Mendes Worldwide, produces the equipment. Oh, and another thing that hasn't changed too much, two bucks a string. Still a pretty cheap night of entertainment. Candlepin's million-dollar man, Don Gillis, is next when we come back. Coming up next, looking back with Boston's first sports anchor, Don Gillis, on the games... He's there! He's there! Somebody! ...and the people. You seem to have a special rapport with Bill Russell. As we've told you, Candlepin Bowling airs for the final time tomorrow morning. It will also be a farewell appearance for host Don Gillis, whose tenure at Channel 5 goes, I was going to say back to the beginning, but it even goes beyond that. He's called the games, he has reported the scores, he has met the giants of sport. He talked about it all with Chronicle's Peter Mahegan. It has been a career that earned him the nickname Versatilis Gillis. Don Gillis, the dean of Boston sportscasters, had the unique distinction of having done play-by-play -play for all four of the hometown pro teams. In overtime, Celtics 110, Los Angeles 107. But it wasn't strictly sports. There were celebrity interviews of the Hollywood variety, like Doris Day and Mary Tyler Moore. And Don even took a spin at being a DJ. The Don Gillis show every Sunday morning. It started out with two hours, and then they kept extending it. It finally went from 8.30 until 1 p.m., I guess. But the greatest thing about that was that I was allowed to play my music. Except for a brief stint in his youth as a lineman for New England Telephone, Don Gillis was destined for a life in broadcasting. When I was in high school, I went to Holy Family High School in uh, New Bedford. And uh, dramatic teacher was Sister Bernadette Marie. And one day she said to me, Mr. Gillis, God gave you the gift of an excellent voice. You should not waste that talent. Donald Gillis, turn off that radio. Don broke into radio at a small startup station in his hometown. As long as I could breathe and talk, they put me to work weekends. And pretty good money, too, 75 cents an hour. <laughs> 20 hours for 15 bucks. But great experience. A hush. He looked. Becoming a play-by-play -play announcer wasn't part of the plan at first. Did you like play-by-play? -play? I loved it. Yeah, I really did. I really did. Didn't know I could do it. Uh, that really started way back in, a, uh, in the small station when three of the teams in New Bedford were all going to the tech tournament. The, the other station that was there had a sportscaster who had been there for a long time. I tried to get our guy to hire a sportscaster to do it. The town is crazy about these, I said. No, only way you're going to do it is if you do it. I said, I've never done play-by-play -play in my life. He said, well, that's it. Gillis was a natural, and special moments like the 68 Harvard-Yale game that saw the Crimson battle back to a miraculous tie earned him a degree of immortality in broadcasting. Champion.
<laughs> it's a hell of a game, isn't oh. it? One of the things that was interesting was that when CBS did a one-hour reflective of 100 years of college football, Charles Kiralt was the host, and they chose to, to end the program with that. And I can still hear Charles saying, Don Gillis on play-by-play. -play. <laughs> Don Gillis was the model for the nightly television sportscaster. He was Boston's first, beginning in 1962 with a seat at the anchor desk of the former Channel 5 WHDH. But the news set was not Gillis's first foray into television. Candlepin Bowling had been up and running since 1958. Although he would not become the regular host until 1967, Don was there right from the start. Two. There is something about Don Gillis, his friendly smile, a gentle calm, that ingratiated him to even the most temperamental of athletes. And thinking about all those wonderful interviews you did and all those athletes you met, you seem to have a special rapport with Bill Russell. He was, as you know, very standoffish, and he didn't trust too many people, and uh, maybe he watched me uh, on television, and uh, when I traveled with the team a few times to do games, perhaps, it's, I guess he just sort of finally said, I guess this guy's okay. We would never exchange anything. We'd never look each other in the eye. I mean, if I look at you, I know you for all these years, and I see you, I say, how you doing, Don? How's everything going in your life? I mean that. And, you know, it's funny, the same situation really existed with, with Red Auerbach, but the crusty, crusty one. But still, I never tried to ingratiate myself, but I just tried to... Well, like you and I talk and so forth. It was that, that sort of a thing. And fortunately, they got to feel the same way. Don Gillis speaks of his years as a broadcaster with great humility, owing his success to having the good fortune to be in the right place at the right time. Looking back at it, Don, would you change anything? Not that I can think of, no. I mean, talk about being, pay being a sports fan, and being paid all your whole career to, to cover things and to sit at a desk and, and introduce things or interview these people. Uh, lucky man, I'll tell you. Till then, I'm Don Gillis. Trust me, the guy is right on. And oh, by the way, I have it on good authority that his golf score is higher than his bowling scores. Back after this break in tonight's Lottery Live. Chronicle returns on Monday night. Mary Richardson has details. Coming up Monday on Chronicle, a kinder, safer, cleaner New York. City officials say squeezing the squeegee guys, sprucing up the parks, and teaching cabbies courtesy are the little things that add up to a lower crime rate. Are they right? Plus, how not to get your pocket picked. Taming New York, Monday on Chronicle. That, of course, is Monday. And here's one last reminder. Set your VCRs if you want to keep it for your own archives. Candlepin Bowling's last show airs tomorrow morning at 10.30 right here on Channel 5, and it will have a special message from Don Gillis. Don Gillis is Candlepin Bowling. Candlepin Bowling has been Don Gillis, and together they have brought you 38 years of terrific entertainment. I'm Ed Harning, and thanks for joining me, and thanks for joining us this evening. And for one last time, you ready for this? Get over! Good night. There is, of course, a right and a wrong way to bowl. Here is the wrong way. Our friend Maplehead...